well, that's me, that's what I did. Uh, uh, I joined Oracle last year. I, I should go, of course, follow my own slides. <laughs> but it's difficult if you cannot do it like this and you can, but Sally would help. I, you can do the next one if you want. Uh, I joined Oracle Consulting because I believe in Oracle Consulting as being from Oracle and for Oracle. The specialism in the product being very nearby the, the product development and also in the industry. Our methodology, for most of you probably know, is the TCM methodology. Some of you were already in the other presentation, but for those who weren't, I want to remind you what that is. And it's about a specific set of uh, implementation. It's it's solution driven, so like we said, we're thinking in cloud, we think about cloud implementations, and we have a lot of experience. So how we can make the best of it? With all that experience, we've created accelerators, we have our templates, we have pre-built solutions based upon what we see that the industry is needing. So it's not like we have this license and the implementation should be this way. We have many different ways to approach it, the manner in the manner that a client would need. So the TCM methodology is about uh, agility, it's about uh, specific phases, it's about discussing with the client uh, what the needs are, but at the same time thinking that there's a, a specific generic platform that is not one size fits all, but it's a great percentage of it which makes the implementation of a solution pretty much more optimal. We don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. There are a lot of things that we learn from each other, we learn what we're implementing, we learn about the industry. And then we have the last part, which is depending, of course, on each of the needs of the client. So that's the TCM, but now it's the agenda. And again, like I said before, it's in my interest to take a step back and talk about the context of global trade. What's global trade? Why, why, is, it, why is it important? Do we know enough about it? Do we see it in our daily work? What, what do we know about it and what, is our, what are our companies doing about it? The agenda of today will be to discuss the evolution of the compliance awareness. Then I will go through the political and economical developments, which are playing a more important role in the last years. The impact in general on global trade, the challenges and some use cases about GTM. When I first started with PwC a long time ago, I remember that when we talked about compliance, it was just a check in the box, actually. It was, you know, we have these clients, we need to audit this, uh, there's a specific rules, okay, we have this list, we will see, oh yeah, I have a paper, I know what it's all about. But actually, there was not really informants back then. Why? Because the economy was growing all over the place, we were thinking about going global, having more free trade agreements, uh, the growth economically in developing countries was going very fast pretty much. The great companies, you know, popping all over the place, more complex uh, supply chains, thinking about sourcing in other places. So it was more of getting richer altogether. It, it didn't matter what the compliance was. So compliance is more of an optional kind of thing. Informants was irregular and statistically not at high risk. So indeed, if not broken, why fix anything? If I get caught and I'm not doing it perfectly, well, I would pay a, fa a fine, but my supply chain wouldn't so suffer anything, so I could just go on. So that was the mentality uh, back in the day. And well, these, these were driven by growth, the multi-country so, uh, supply chains, and the liberalization. Like I said, we were having a lot more free trade agreements signed, and if I say something you may not be aware of, just tell me and I'll explain. But sometimes I take for granted some of the general concepts of global trade. But uh, that was the context. And then what happened? We had a terrible day. Everybody knows where they were at this moment, the 9-11. That was a, change, a, a, change, a game changer for everybody. Everybody become uh, in panic. Uh, a lot of things needed to change. We needed to think all of a sudden about security, security driven. Uh, uh, we cannot ship goods. I remember even a lot of a lot of shipments were stopped 
and people couldn't move at the very beginning. So we changed from growth and becoming rich and having more supply chains with cheaper uh, materials. We moved to security drivers and we had different initiatives. I remember one of the first ones was the city path in the US whereby you needed to secure your whole supply chain. So you needed to check even your, your facilities. You needed to have specific controls that people that were not authorized couldn't be there. Uh, you had also some benefits, for example, because back then I was in Mexico. I remember we needed to make some kind of the same uh, pro program in Mexico to make sure that if you, you were certified, you could use the green line you know, to move faster because otherwise you would be facing a lot of stops that may be appealing to you from the transport point of view. So if you didn't have that, you couldn't move fast. Then we had here in Europe the, the uh, AEO, the Authorized Economic Operator, which is based actually in one of the initiatives from the World, World Customs Organization, which also means actually being in control, which means you know what you're doing, but you also know what your supplier is doing, and you know what your goods are going to, and you have a proper framework to know what's happening. So that's the concept of AO, and there are many countries which have adopted this concept. Here in Europe, it's a, it's a, it's a funny story. Here in Europe, for many um, uh, member states, and I say member states as the official name of the countries which are in the customs union, uh, the member states, for some of them, it didn't have any L value because we had already a lot of facilities here, so I don't need to comply with the AO. Why? I mean, I still, I, I already have a local clearance uh, uh, at my facilities. Why? Why should I? What? What the uh, the European Commission did is that they said, okay, you think you have the benefits, but you need to reassess what you're doing. If you don't get the assessment well, then you will lose what you already got. So you know, if that happens, then. Now companies become more interested. They don't want to lose that, those kind of facilities, which are pretty, pretty interesting. It's being able to customs clear your goods without bringing it to the, for example, to the customs uh, uh, offices, having other specific uh, licenses like uh, origin licenses, the authorized uh, exporter, and many other. And without being granted the status, you cannot get them. You cannot get them now. So that's something that's like a push for companies to think about their global uh, trade framework to have them in place and to have them properly being checked and monitored. And we'll go to the next one. This, is, this was, of course, purely from a global trade point of view. Uh, we still have other very important movements in the last years, and that's the political and economical. We see here some pictures. The OLAF is for the fraud. Is uh, uh, for example, when you have origin claim, that means if I uh, import goods from Mexico, because we have a free trade agreement, if I comply with specific origin rules, then I can get, for example, a 0% rate import in on, on specific products. Or maybe not 0, 1 instead of 10, but it's actually a direct saving to your costs. So it's a very interesting one. What happens now? Every time there's an advantage, people want to circumvent them. They want to get it easy, they don't want to invest in that. What do they do? Fraud in some cases. So there was a lot more of enforcement to make sure that that doesn't happen. We have the OLAF that's in the European Union to go and check specifically. You see it a lot in Asia that origin is claimed based upon countries which have preferential uh, treatment when importing in the European Union, but they don't actually do that. In many cases, goods are actually produced in China, for example. And if you don't have the proper control in your supply chain, you may have a problem here because you thought your supplier told you it was uh, of uh, Vietnamese origin and you claimed that and you didn't pay duties and later the authorities came all of went to see in a while there's nothing in Vietnam there's not even a factory so at the end of the day you have to pay those duties and it's not to get you scared it's just to give you a little bit of context that it's a lot more than we think when we talk about global trade uh, and we also see now the Brexit when I was preparing this presentation, some people told me, oh, maybe you could discuss Brexit. And I thought, oh, maybe by then we know what's actually going to happen. It, 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 it's up that we still don't know, only that probably uh, we may get a small delay, but at the end of the day, something is almost 
100% safe and sure, and that means that we will have the EU leaving the, the European Union. The political loss of saying, I'm not going to do is very big. So you know, the fragmentation in, in the UK is quite huge. So we cannot expect they will turn back. So probably will happen. But what does it mean that for trade? Does, have we mapped already what we needed to do? Do we have the, the proper controls to know where are we going to do the import clear, uh, the customs clearance? Do we know which route, routing we are going to use? Is there going to be a lot of uh, delays? Those kind of things you need to think ahead. And if we have a, a proper framework, which is automated, that helps you think a lot, that you don't forget things that, because you're busy, you don't forget things on a daily basis, it makes your life much easier. You don't have to run risks that are not necessary, and probably you also will get some gains and, and savings. Do we also have that? That's another. Of course, it's close to close, close to my heart because that's the, the NAFTA. I remember when the NAFTA was signed, and you know, last year it's been renegotiated with the new Trump administration. You may say what you want, positive or negative. One thing is for sure, Mr. Trump is a disruptor. The things are changing very, very, very fast. And well, for people that are, for example, in the automotive industry, they feel, they're feeling the major duties that have been imposed on aluminum, for example, but we are also, we discussed this earlier with some people, we are also expecting that uh, additional duties are going to be imposed on finished cars, which is also a huge, a huge impact on the automotive industry, for example. Uh, and we have all the kinds of discussions like the BEPS, which is also very relevant. That's regarding the profit sharing in the world. So uh, you see, if you have a proper corporate uh, income tax uh, structure, you may end up not paying taxes in no place. You're shifting from a place that where actually the production has been made to a place where there's a I wouldn't say tax evasion uh, uh, jurisdiction, but let's say a more friendly uh, taxable uh, situation. Now, that's probably not illegal in many cases, but it's not more in the opinion, in the public opinion, you cannot say that you are not paying anything. You have, you have to have a proper share, a fair share, to every part of the supply chain. Everybody has to gain, not only move to one place and leave the places where the actual revenue has, has been created without having the proper share. So that's the context of the global trade in general. We have more developments. Uh, of course, the IT revolution. Uh, in many cases, for example, specifically in customs, uh, we, I think it was like probably eight years ago, maybe more. I mean, I've been a while in this world, but uh, the, the European Commission made a study on their, what they call the Vision 2020. You, you hear this Vision 2020 in many other areas. But for customs, originally it would mean that we would be in a paperless environment. So it would mean that it would be an infrastructure across the whole European Union with the same IT platform where they could share all the information with you, which has have a, a single entry point, for example. Beautiful idea. It will happen, I guess, at some point, but it's so difficult to get consensus amongst all the, <laughs> the member states. I mean, we are just still having the problem with Brexit, and it's just only one. Uh, imagine if each of the member states needs to agree on a specific IP system. So it's not happening, but that's the idea. And the idea is at least to have the paperless, uh, uh, paperless customs. It's happening, uh, but fragmented. So in many member states, indeed, you can lodge import and export declarations electronically. And that's the exception is the paper, but it's not yet a platform. That's the, the movement. You see also, for example, the uh, collaboration, uh, international collaboration of the authorities. They are exchanging more information. Uh, electronic audit initiatives, so as the SFT and blockchain to you know ascertain that things are happening as they should and that they are not altered. And what we discussed earlier, I guess, the uh, trade related Brexit, the renegotiation of the FTAs, like I mentioned, the NAFTA is now they use MCA, the new name, but also some changes. And trade wars. Trade wars is, is very relevant nowadays. We see again, like I mentioned with, with Mr. Trump, 
uh, it's like looking who's firing the, the you know with the biggest uh, weapon. Then China reacts. Then we have also Mexico. Then we have also Turkey. Manufacturing countries actually. Uh, the, the shifting of the manufacturing to other countries is actually being triggered by this kind of trade wars. But again, as, as companies, what can we do? I mean, if something is happening, you need to anticipate. You need to think, okay, I'm sourcing now from this part, but I'm going to pay all of a sudden a lot more. So I need to shift. Do I have a platform that helps me think along? Can I already make simulations about, for example, how much something would cost if I import it from another place or if I just run my bill of materials with different import duty rates. I'm just giving you ideas of what GTM can, can do and how it relates directly to, uh, to global trade. And I think global trade. I'm trying to give you also the whole picture because for one company, it means something, and for the other, it may, may mean something else. But in principle, you have a wide range of elements that play a role. And uh, you have the AOIC, that is the administrative organization and uh, internal controls. They have the legal framework, supply chain optimization, managed risks, documentation, customs management, and audit trail. Many companies, especially small ones, they're just seeing the customs management. Just seeing, I'm launching an import declaration, I'm getting the goods, I'm selling them, I'm done. And they are, without knowing, probably running risks, but they don't, sometimes they don't consider that there are also supply optimization items. And if you don't have the information, it's quite difficult. That's why we also need to use uh, sometimes uh, our content partners, because it's so relevant to know how much you pay or you could pay, depending on the sourcing, depending on the origin of the products you are going to import, but also, and I'm very happy that there, this morning we discussed also some of the evolvements of GTM regarding free trade agreements, that you can also yourself start thinking how you can make it happen to your supplier as well. So that's, that's very interesting and very important. So again, this is in, a, in an ideal way a company would have all of this. What's sad in some cases is that some companies do have it, but they don't even know. So this is in one part of the company, you have it in the logistics part, the other one is in, in the legal department, and they don't communicate. It's a, a silent mentality, and it's really sad. So what do we see in practice? What do we see in practice? We see lack of awareness on what global trade is, and the impact to the business. Again, I wanted to make this session a slightly different because I've spoken to many of the people here and everybody has heard about GTM or global trade, but we don't really grasp what actually is and what's the importance in a, in a company. So indeed, that lack of awareness is, I, I, I consider myself like the preacher of GTM, the preacher of, of the, what global trade is and importance of it. Sometimes on, on, on availability to see potential uh, liabilities uh, because contingencies are very difficult to quantify. When you are talking to possible clients as well, it's very difficult to say, oh, if you don't do something, something may happen. It's very difficult. You know, the low hanging fruit is always, what can I save? What's, what's in it for me? And yeah, there are some savings as well in terms of sourcing and, and FDAs. But the real important thing is that companies should should uh, aspire as to be in control, in control to know what's happening and to have a proper framework. The, what we just discussed, uh, those missing global trade optimization opportunities because they don't know about the uh, free trade agreements, because they think that's very difficult. It's a complex regulatory uh, uh, area, R rules of origin, what is that? I don't need to, I don't, I don't want to do that. I just want to have my product from A to B, and that's it. But there are a lot of gains there, and it's, it's actually one of my favorite uh, subjects. So if you want to change thoughts, I can give you some insights on that. Uh, and the silo mentality, like I just said, sometimes you have actually logistics focusing purely on the transport, regulatory here, just putting fires down if they don't have the proper framework, or just making sure that everything's running smoothly but completely uh, separated from each other. And 
this is a, this is even sadder because I saw it in my previous professional life having actually your guidelines all everything regarding all the processes perfectly written perfectly described what should everybody do but nicely put in a in a drawer nobody does it I mean in, pre in principle they just said okay I complied with it I put it in in the box and that's it and this is something we can automate directly into JTM. If you already did the work, you can actually, actually put that into a, into a system that helps you not having to think about it. You already thought about it. You know your business, you already had a strategy, and you need to make sure that it's actually happening, because otherwise it's a loss of time, resources. Um, and again, sometimes you have the initiative to automate processes, but not involving the relevant stakeholders. And that's also something I've seen very, very often. We are sometimes thinking about OTM and pitching OTM, and that's appealing to all the people that's here. But I, maybe what I'm saying for you sounds like a bracadabra. So we need to make sure that people know if that's not to you, that you know, well, but the person next to me actually is handling that. And maybe if we have the same platform, why don't we make use of the economies of the scale, for example. And again, implementations that are done purely from a technical perspective without industry context. That's also, we've seen it also happening not with us, but we've seen cases by which the implementation sounded perfectly, there was no problem in running all the engines, but it didn't really react, uh, reflect what the industry needed. And the, the, what, the, what you know, what the people that should be there were there, so it's it's also a, a a problem. So my question to you: Think about it. Are you in control? And I, I'm meaning you or your clients. I mean, we are all in the same boat. It's a broad concept, and can can have different meanings depending on the geography you are, depending on your industry, depending on your profile. Are you a distribution company? Are you a manufacturing company? So it may mean something different to you, but you have to think about it. Be open about that. Uh, see what, what's, what's the status now. Do you have, for example, and that's, that's a question to you, and do you have, for example, overview of procedures related to international and trade customs? Do you have visibilities of duties paid per year per geography? Do you make use of all the available FTAs? Do you know that they exist? Uh, do you have an origin framework? Do you, how do you manage your export controls if your product is actually subject to export controls and dual use? And do you have a backup plan? If something changes, do you have a, a change management in place to know you, so that you can react fast and that you can still be running your business without disruption? If you don't know this, or never heard about this, or never thought about this, then we have a problem. We need to think a little bit more, and we need to address this to the people. If you don't know it yourself, at least you need to know that somebody in your company knows it and is doing it. So it could be a driver. It could be, it could be something that probably is, it exists, but let us break that silent mentality. So this is a general uh, framework without automation. So the, it's awareness data, information, procedures, implementation, monitoring monitoring and update, but it can turn to be, so I understand that many people just push back. Uh, in principle, they say, no, it's, it's a, a very truly process and we need to do it all over and all over again. That may be, well be the case if you're doing manually, but if you do it in an automatic way, it doesn't have to be that often. It's just managing exceptions. That's the whole idea of the GTM part. You think about it very well, you design it very well since the very beginning, and then it's all about the exceptions and the updates. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is the, the next step is the GTM. Sometimes I see people think it's so, so big that it's difficult to implement. But there's as big or as small as you want it. You, if you think it's so tricky and you want so, sustainability in your business and you want to grow with it, why don't you start small but with a vision? Where am I going to, what do, you, what, what do I want to reach? There's, Let's talk about it. Let's think uh, together and see with how we, we can get, uh, help you to get there. 
the, one of the, well, but this is some of the elements of, of GTM which I love, which is that it's a collaborative tool, it's very flexible, configurable, it's a cloud solution, and it's a constant, <coughs> constant evolution. We see all the time, all the new releases have all the time very interesting changes in functionality. It's also opening, uh, if you have some enhancements, uh, queries, you are listening to. So I think, I mean, when I first joined Oracle, I thought it's like a Rolls Royce in a garage. I mean, it's, it's such a great, a great uh, tool to use. And I'm not going to go through all the functionality. I leave it in the background. But you know that it's very flexible, that it can be very small, depending on what you need, and that we can help you to think through. We can help you with our in industry knowledge us all background and to see how you can get there. If it, 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 it's even only just having the, the logic, the cost consideration, that's an option, but it's so much more what we can do together. This is not for everybody, but I guess that the people from OTM are always thinking about the part from the top. And I want you to think also about the part beneath because it's the same platform. It's, isn't it beautiful? It's the same platform, so we can use information for, that is already there. We can pull it, we can use it. And it's, it's actually validating each other. It's, it's, very, very, it's very nice, actually. And these are some cases I'm just, I don't want to go to the typical restricted part screening because when I ask people what do they know about global trade and what do they know about GTM, it's all, the first answer is always restricted price screening. It's because it's the way it started, of course. But it's much more than that. So that's why in the cases I just wanted to discuss with you, it has nothing, not necessarily something to do with, with the restricted price screening, but it's more about the visibility all over your operation. It's connecting the dots. It's not, you can have the repository of your information. You can do whatever you want. We have so, much more functionality available. You can think about compliance rules, agents, business monitors. It's very, very agnostic and very, very flexible. But in this case, and they needed to have a due diligence to check whether everything was going fine. And in that company, they had manufacturing facilities in different places. They had experts from, uh, from other places and imports in the European Union, and experts from the European Union to other places and without evidence, you are nowhere. It doesn't matter if you actually know for sure that the products, you, that the materials you bought in Vietnam were produced there, but if you don't have the evidence, I mean, I don't want part of my friends, you're screwed. You really, you cannot, you cannot uh, show that. And if you, if you have an audit and you have to import, you have the liability relation with the importer. That's the, this, this, the starting point in the European Union. Luckily, they were capable actually to, you know, to detect this, these deviations. By having an automated repository, you can tackle this, of course, because you have different restricted profiles. You know that information has not been tempered. You know that it's in a, a specific place. You can pull it off. You can pull the rules, and you can make sure that it runs smoothly. And this is, again, for origin purposes. But origin, I mean, in, in the world of customs, you have three main pillars, and that's the classification, which, of course, probably you've all seen in all, all the presentations of GTM. It's a customs valuation which follows specific rules and is the origin. Both, uh, all, of three, uh, all these three elements are interrelated because each product, each product that exists and is commercially uh, tra tradable, it has to have a classification code and it follows the specific rules. It's not like I'm going to choose the one who fits me best. There are specific, very difficult to follow rules, depending on the industry, because some products are more difficult. But depending on the rules, that's the code for that product, and that code is related to different tariffs in different countries. So if you are also having the origin calculation, and it's based upon a wrong classification code, your whole procedure is, is wrong. I mean, you probably, again, in fact, it is originating, or in fact, that's a product, but if your, your premises, your, your first basis is wrong, then the conclusion by definition will be also wrong. So by, again, in this case, by having a, a single source of truth, 
uh, and different uh, specific profiles which are um, safe, not to tamper, that was possible to, again, streamline the whole process and uh, have the evidence for this, this point. And if you go back, I just wanted to say this because I know that's what's more appealing to everybody. It doesn't matter everything that I've been saying. Reduction liability from 3,7% 3, 3, of uh, under or over rated duties because that's the issue. With a different classification, it was even paying either paying 3,7% or 0%. But again, it's uh, full visibility on uh, trade operation and audit trail. The other, the other one I wanted to discuss. Let me see. Oh yeah, if you remember what I said about the AO, the status that grants you specific additional facilities, trade facilitation. It's simplifications for customs clearance, for having a specific permits. The in this case was a company who need. They already were AO certified but they had a reassessment. This was implemented in the European Union, you know, to make sure companies actually were doing something with the AO, and it's every five years, they will come and reassess you. Um, in this case, it was for them very important, it was a very good moment to actually do the reassessments internally. Are, are we actually following the controls we once thought were interesting or were relevant? And at the same time, at the, back then, we had a new system in, in, in the Netherlands, the AGS, which is for the import and export. And uh, they wanted to have a, this new partner to have the, the connectivity. So it was the momentum for them, you know, to uh, put everything in place. All that was made for the AO was actually put into the uh, into the system in a way that for the, for the authorities when they were reassessing they could also check everything what they're saying is backed up by what you have in the system so uh, making sure as well that there's not disruption as to the being able to make the export declarations via the Netherlands and in this case restricted price spreading was indeed one of the of the items but again I want you to think about GTM a global trade for the matter in a more broad perspective as the basics to be in control, as the basics to know that what you thought about and what you need to comply with is in place and that it's visible and that it's auditable. Yeah? And uh, the last one is, this is again more appealing because it was related to market expansion. It's a very company that is a producer of coffee and tea and they were acquiring also other companies in different uh, places all over the globe. But uh, because they had this flexibility and the possibility to go and manufacture different types of coffee and different blends, it was for them very necessary to know where they could do that in the best possible way. It was where can we pay less duties and where is it less restringent to <coughs> comply with the origin rules, for example, because Back then, for example, if it was an NAFTA, you needed to have at least 70, 65% of national content and it had to be brewed or it had to be roasted there. Whereas in another places of the world, it was easier. It was 30%, so maybe they couldn't meet this, but they could meet this one and still be uh, profitable. So again, having all the repository of the possibilities that you may have, how to have visibility and actually and be in position to make use of all the benefits you could. And the potential savings, again, something I need to say, it's 2% to 10%, which maybe for you guys it doesn't sound much, but of course, in a production side, it's, it, can, it can mean actually your profit. So it's very relevant. So I don't know how I'm doing in time because I tend to talk much, but I tend also to talk very fast. <laughs> Oh, I think I did fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, again, and that's fine because we can have a discussion later. We can we can have some questions about it. But the conclusion, and I hope I made a point about that, is that that uh, GTM it's it's a, a a very powerful engine for companies. That global trade in itself, it's you can see it as a necessary evil or a possibility to have savings but it's something that is necessary. 
So you need to think about that. If your clients are not thinking about that, or you yourself haven't thought about that, just give it a thought, because there's much there, more than you would think. And it's not as complicated as you think, probably at the beginning, but you're not alone. I'm here to help you. <laughs> and uh, the, by having automat automated solu uh, an automated solution, of course, you have error preventions, you have low visibility, you can have, uh, like someone I mentioned earlier, the global template, but you can have regional or local implementations to the flavor of the specific jurisdictions. Uh, you can enhance internal cross-area collaboration because we need to tackle this silo mentality, this, uh, this skilling the business, we need to work together. And uh, uh, the possibility to start small and grow in functionality, I mean, some, some companies want to start big, but in any case, it's very good to, you know, to get acquainted with the tool, to, to have your priorities first and then move to little by little to the 100% compliant and optimal uh, uh, scenario, of course. And this is an interesting and important one. Let us not forget that it's actually the same product. OTM and GTM is the same product. Why aren't we seeing more uh, projects together? I mean, I've seen movement the last time globally, but I hope that there's more movement. And I'm not talking only because I'm mostly, yes, I'm talking from my background. I see the need for companies. They, they, you cannot go without it. So it, we need to, to, to work on it. And finally, again, the, well, no, not finally, the compatibility with other systems is something I hear very often. If we can, for example, uh, collaborate or work with SAP or with other ERPs, that's also like OTM. It's, it's nice because it's agnostic and we can work with, with all, of the, all of the possible systems out there. And finally, this is yes, of course, I'm promoting myself. It's uh, Oracle Consulting Experience and Industry Notes. And now I'm open for questions. Not so many.